we're back. Back in Anthony Kuzabucky's backyard. We'll get to that in a minute. Welcome to the 13th installment. Should have done this yesterday. It was Friday the 13th. 13th installment of the Smart to Noise Ratio. Shh. It is Friday it the 13th. It is Friday the 13th. Tour time strikes again. Yeah. I live in the Twilight Zone. <laughs> well, hey, it's Friday the 13th. We are pleased to bring you, take three, the 13th. <laughs> 13th edition of the Smart to Noise Ratio Pro Audio Podcast. I'm your host, John Dayton. With me, to my immediate left, is Anthony Kuzabucky. Hey there. And a little further to my left is Carl Maciag. Mosquitoes should be on top of the food chain. <laughs> Welcome back, Carl. It's been a they while. Are, they are tonight. And all the way over in the peanut gallery is Amanda Kuzabucky, Anthony's charming wife, here for color commentary, should she show choose. I may be... <laughs> I may be a bit in and out tonight. I'm actually on call. I uh, got set up for a three-day festival yesterday, and that was the only day I was available to mix. So my lighting guy, who is actually a relatively accomplished mixer, is uh, turning the knobs, pushing the faders tonight. But we're uh, we're still getting him up to speed on all the little details of things. So my uh, hasn't been going crazy, but my phone is lighting up here periodically, so I may have to solve some problems remotely. It wouldn't be the first time you've mixed over text. I have mixed by telephone, I have mixed by text, and just Walkie recently talking. we have mixed via two-way radio, <laughs> which that was probably the best of them. It was, it was like having a little engineer right inside <laughs> my headphones. <laughs> so uh, anyway, we have gathered in the backyard because it's been hot as heck all week and the, uh, the sun's down. We have a nice lake breeze wafting into the greater Buffalo metropolitan area. There's a, uh, a campfire snapping for some reason, because uh, not because we need the warmth, but because People who live in the country feel the need to burn things of a summer night. We have uh, some traffic rushing by to provide that uh, beautiful open air sound. And somewhere we were trying to estimate, we figure about two miles distant, uh, either a drinking establishment or a grad party is hosting some karaoke tonight. It's about that time of the year. I just heard a very drunk man sing a Beyonce song, and even filtered <laughs> by two miles of atmosphere. That was pretty horrendous. It still sounds <laughs> awful. There's, there's two miles of reverb, still doesn't. Wow. Two miles of reverb still doesn't doesn't counter that vocal. And there's probably not a plug-in that can scrub that for us. So sorry if that uh, that happens again. Maybe we'll take it inside. <laughs> so anyway, I've uh, got a couple of topics to cover. Um, wanted to get Carl to weigh in on compressors and compression since we had a couple of shows go off on those topics. And uh, I received a few tweets to the effect that he would uh, like to sink his teeth into those. Then uh, we're hoping, if that doesn't take the whole show, and it easily could, not that anybody would mind, <laughs> we're going to get into, uh, we had two posts go up on the blog, that's uh, smart, the number two, noise.blogspot.com, for anybody that uh, listens but doesn't read, you should get in there and read, it's occasionally good. Um, we had two posts go up in the last week about advanced nightmares, and I had two advanced nightmares just this weekend, and <laughs> Carl's got a cut, uh, well, who doesn't? Everybody's got some. Who doesn't really? So, like, yeah, we're, we're not going to go into the philosophy or anything, but uh, we'll probably just swap a couple horror stories there for, because, you know, we're sitting around the campfire. Why not? We can uh, take turns holding our flashlights up to our faces and get into that. And then uh, should a third topic arise, we will deal with that when we come to it. So, anyway, starting off, uh, we went through our list, excuse me, of favorite compressors, favorite hardware compressors, and... Uh, I, don't, I didn't give Carl much advance on this, but I'm, I'm sure he's got at least one that he can start talking right on the tip of his tongue and uh, enlighten us a bit, and then uh, we'll just see, how, see where it goes from there. I like the DV6, DVX 160s. Yeah. Yes. Um, single channel, that's okay. But the reason I like them is they're simple to set. You have your threshold, your ratio, and your output gain, and uh, everything else is done in the box, and they're they sound good. They sound good, and they're fast. Yep. It's you know. Oh, and there's the over easy button, mm. Mm. which I don't find myself using a lot. I hardly ever do. I like it on a kick yeah. once in a while, but I, I learned that trick from you, and I use it ever so sparingly. Yeah, I just don't don't seem to use it, but I see a lot of guys that do. But um, that's my bread and butter for vocals, and uh, you know. Depending on what type of music it is, you can't go wrong with, you know, four to one, you know, getting maybe four dB of reduction when they're singing normal up to even 10 dB when they're really laying in and it really doesn't seem 
to, uh, you, you just can't hear it, which is great. I love it. Um, interesting thing I saw a few years back uh, with a guy using the 160s. It was, uh, you know, some 80s group that was still touring, and their engineer had been with them, with them forever. And he actually used the 160s as kind of a reverse ducker. And what he would do is, and he, you know, asked permission, um, you know, first he asked, do you have good limiters on the house rig? Well, yeah, we do. Okay. He goes, what he wanted to do is run the band at like plus three, plus six on the console going right out. And then when the singer was singing, he wanted to have to push it to like plus 10. <laughs> <laughs> and mm, 80s. the 160 would kick in in such a way that the band would be blaring when the band was playing without the singer, but when the singer came in, it just kind of brought everything down, but the vocal was still coming out on fronts, coming out on top, I should say. So it, uh, I don't know, I had never seen anybody do it before, and... It worked, and I think the only reason it did work because it was just so freaking loud in the room <laughs> that you know you just your head was at its own max headroom. So was that, you know, did that happen to be the band that hung their symbols from chains? I don't think so. No, okay, different <laughs> different band I'm thinking of. There's, yeah, there's another band that played I, um, Infinity or a different room. No, this was uh, Rock and Roll Heaven. Okay. R.I.P. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, um, yeah, I've, I've never seen anybody else do it, and this guy swore by it, and the band employed him for a couple of decades, so it was working for him, and it it worked all right, but he said he can only do it, the, once, the 160 is the only compressor that will allow him to do that, and, you know, if he has anything else... Um, Guess to mix uh, normal, <laughs> but when he has the one sixties, it you know he can slam it like that, and it you know cool effect, I guess. Um, but you know, some people swear by the one sixty A's more than the one sixty X's. Um, I don't know. I can't tell a difference I, personally. I, I've I, never AB them though. I've, I've only used the 160. I don't think I've ever actually had a chance to use the 160X. Mm -hmm. But the 160As, I love I love on kick drum. Mm -hmm. um, and they're, they're really nice on snare, too, if you don't have if you don't have a whole channel strip to run them through. For live, especially, I, li I like the 160As a lot for for some decent snare reduction and, and pop. Mm -hmm. I never use snare. I never use comps on snares live. And I probably should. <laughs> With, well, I do with inconsistent drummers yeah. and pork pies. With <laughs> well, hey, there there are people there. Teaspoon, Teaspoon plays a pork pie, and for that that session that I played for you, yet another category where that man falls into the right. vast he minority. Just, oh my gosh, <laughs> he he's a monster. But he played a thirteen by five and a half or six and a half pork pie. I played it for John, and let him listen to the whole thing. He's like, yeah, it sounded really good. I was like. Oh yeah, no that that was pork pie, and uh, and nobody nobody knew the difference. It just sounded like a nice big fat, not quite Black Beauty mm -hmm. character to it, but it had a nice thick six and a half wood snare um, characteristic to it. Very nice. Well, so was, if a pork pie falls in the forest and it doesn't it, sound like a pork pie, <laughs> is it still a pork pie? Is it still a pork pie? If it's less than seven inches, then it probably. <laughs> Uh. <clears throat> um, other compressors. BSS has a quad unit mm. that's very nice. I use that. I can't remember the model number. Um, it might have been like a 401C. I don't know. Uh, but it was blue, and it had British spelling on it. <laughs> and, <laughs> Lots uh, of S's, no C's. Yeah. <laughs> a couple um, extra E's on it. Very nice. I mean, again, that I believe was a threshold ratio output, and then I think like a fast and slow mm -hmm. attack switch or something like that. But they had it right, you know. 
Very cool. But what's nice about those, the higher end stuff, is that they know what what actually sounds good, and unfortunately, with a lot of the the lower end stuff, you got this giant <laughs> sweepable threshold point where mm-hmm. you know it. It, it works for certain stuff, but if you're working with a professional type group, you don't need all of that stuff. Like the fast and slow, like you just you flick it to one end or the other, that'll take care of it. If you got a drummer that's good enough, and uh, or either a vocalist or or bass player that really kind of holds their own independently, you don't need a whole type of uh, a whole other threshold setting. Well, that's the case across the board. I mean, we run into good musicians. They, I just. In addition to my horror stories, in the last couple of weeks, I've had a couple really nice groups that I've worked for where the, the set just mixes itself. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, that's that's where the good gear belongs is on groups like that. Right. But you're totally right. Like, you can buy a Behringer for 150 bucks. It's got more knobs on it than the Space Shuttle to the point where, I mean, I've been mixing for 20 years and I can't figure out some of those things. Like, contour? What is this? What is that? <laughs> I pushed it. I don't think it did anything. Yeah. It increases the awesome. <laughs> yeah. You're not you're not mixing it high enough is the problem. Uh, right. You're not getting enough awesome in your mix. Right. Yeah, there's there's a certain charm to that old DBX with just the more slider. Right. Exactly. Mm-hmm. That I, I like to be limited too. I mean, a lot of the greatest discoveries that I've ever heard of were like even if you're using the box for what it's supposed to be used for. I mean, forget discovering new and interesting uses for things, but just not having the options. Like uh, right. in the extreme case, going back to like all the great recordings that were made at Muscle Shoals, they had a desk. Mm, yep. They had 10 mics, and they made some of the greatest rock and roll records of all time. They're, yeah, I was talking about it earlier. One of uh, one of our buddies, uh, Will, played. He was the guitar player in the Muscle Shoals rhythm section for a long time. He ended up playing with, uh, he was Bonnie Raitt's guitar player for her, her big run through the 70s. I think like 69 through 76 or 74. But all the stuff back then... You went in and you recorded. It wasn't. It wasn't. You recorded drums. You recorded bass. You recorded guitars. It was. You know. Maybe, maybe you laid down your rhythm section and then, if you had the luxury of doing it on top, you did vocals on top of that. But there's there's a whole band technique to it, mm-hmm. and I, I feel like there's a lot of that lost in modern music production where you you know you, you have somebody come in and lay a rhythm track, scratch track. You have somebody else come in and do. The drum track and bass, and you layer on top of it, and that's that's your standard for recording production now. But there's there's a certain feel and a certain a depth to recording a whole band at the same time because they they get what they're doing, and and whether or not it's it's a hundred percent on the click or not, um, sometimes it just sounds better. Yep. You know, if if they vary off the click, a few BPMs. I've heard a number of tracks that have been, I'm doing air quotes here, corrected to the beat, and it just sucks the life out of me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There there are people that just, that, there are people that need to be corrected, and there are people that aren't. There's, uh... There's you wouldn't some, auto-tune Sinatra, don't... Right, yeah. exactly. Yeah, there, there are people that you don't need to... There, Carter Beaufort, sweet Jesus, if you put Beat Detective on Carter Beaufort, <laughs> you've got some problems. <laughs> Um, I think they would probably tear a rift in the fabric of space and time. Right, yeah, like, there there are certain people that just don't, like, it's not that they can't play on beat, it's that they're playing off beat, or just a touch behind or ahead for a purpose. Mm-hmm. Um, I know Peter's, well, Peter's not the best example. Steve Padden, I guess is a better example. Like, if he's, if Steve Padden isn't playing 100% on the beat or off the beat, there's a purpose for it. It's not just because he lost the click. It's because there's this dynamic in the song that he's trying to achieve mm-hmm. that whether or not there's a click there or not, he's going to achieve and essentially screw your click is what it comes down to. And that's a real trick to... Although he does play to one a lot. He yeah. does. Oh, absolutely. He does. Like, for for all their live stuff, he does. And that's... there's I, I, have, I have no qualms with that at all, but mm-hmm. if there's something that he's recording, he feels... Like, I, I trust his feel more than mine. Right. Hands down. If he wants to speed something up or slow something down or play a tail in front of or behind the beat, that's totally his prerogative, and he's got a lot more ground to stand on than I do. Mm-hmm. Um, talking from a guy that, you know, Steve has played multinational tours with multinational acts, 
that have sold millions of albums, if he wants to play a 30 second behind, he's probably got a good reason for playing a 30 second behind. As opposed to you saying, you know, you should really play on the click. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that that's where the differentiation comes in between. Well, not not comes between, but, you know, there, there's a certain live aspect and there's a studio aspect where you know, I, I've worked with them in the studio. And if they want to play a touch behind to give it a certain depth to it, then they play behind a touch. And it's not it's not your problem to solve. It's it's part of the music. Mm-hmm. Oh, we totally diverged there, but I have a, a Sorry. great... No, no, it's, it's cool. This is our third topic, everybody. Click tracks. When we get to topic two. Huh? When we get to topic two? No, we, we skip topic over two right. after this. <laughs> All right. We're on topic <laughs> three. Go on. I Spring and summer gave it a miss, and it was winter again. Yeah. Um, I found that I hate playing with drummers who are not on a click, even if I'm not hearing the click. It, it just kind of helps me lock in, and now when I play, it's uh, I do get the click a little bit in my ears. But really, all I use that for is to, you know, tap in uh, tempos on stuff at the beginning of songs or quiet passages or something like that. And uh, you know, I rely on the feel of the drummer, and you know, I don't really notice that much if it strays with the guy I play with, um, guys I play with, Steve included, but. Um, I guess I don't pay attention to that much because at that point I'm paying attention to the the song and how it feels. So, but um, you know, I think it's good just to have um, kind of that uniformity. You know, it's helpful. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And, we had that. You again. know, the, the good drummers can play with feeling, even though the click is going on in their head. Right. You know, there's just we had- a little adjustments they make. We're having that experience at the church where I work now that we, in the last year, have started playing exclusively to a click. Mm -hmm. Uh, Just this last week, we had a special number that we did just for walk-in music that was kind of funky. And in rehearsal, we were feeling like it just wasn't quite getting there. Like, it it almost had that, like, Stevie Wonder... uh, Motown type of, just just a touch behind the beat. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, it really, it felt like it wanted to be in the pocket a little bit, and it, it kind of wasn't, but, you know, <laughs> we live in Western New York. There's a lot of white people. German and Polish blood <laughs> flowing in the veins, so, you know. It's it's one and three or nothing the, around here. <laughs> yeah. The pocket's a lot to hope for, but uh, it happened that we got thrown a curveball. The pastor asked if, like, on the fly, if they would play it again for walkout music, because it got such a good reaction, and... For I won't go into the details, but it wasn't going to be possible for my video people to play the click back without having a lot of other stuff going. Like, basically, the announcements were going to have to run again yeah. as video, and we didn't want to kill the mood with that. And the drummer had an option. He had the option to punch it up on an iPad that sits next to him, um, but didn't. They just went with it, and it was just cool to see, like, ah, you know, it, it something slid into place at that point. And uh, the second time around, all three services that we did it was, was just better and cooler. And, you know, what it is is we just conditioned our musicians to always be looking for that click, whether right. they, they really fixate on it, you know, if it's pumping in their ears, and they, uh, you know, they really drill down and get attached to it, or if it's just there as a reference. When it's gone, they're all either, you know, actively or passively looking for that reference. And as long as the drummer is solid... Excuse me. Um, as long as the drummer's solid, everybody instinctively goes to that. And if he's rocking and rolling a little bit, then everything works they, out so that, really nice. Yeah. One, one of the nice things that we've had is our our main drummer on Sunday mornings, and well, Sunday services in general was uh, he played marching snare mm. forever. Um, he's a pharmaceutical salesman now, but um, he understands the dynamic and stuff. So if he'll start something, he'll stick with that BPM all service long, but if it, if it requires, you know, for the chorus, pick it up 4, 6, 8 BPM, he'll do that, but everybody follows him. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not a, you know, drastic instead of 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, you know, real quick, like, he'll build into it, and everybody will catch on to it, and it's not a, it's not a drastic increase or decrease in BPM, it's, it's a dynamic change instead of just a, a, a speed change, I mm-hmm. guess. Which is which is really nice. Like I give the guy a lot of credit for being able to to pick up from just playing, you know, or orchestral percussion to playing a full kit. The guy's 
you know, he's, he's nothing crazy. He's your, your regular, like, the guy could sit in, on an ACDC set and have no problem, but most people with Pulse could, too. And that's nice when your drummer picks up 10 beats a minute, <laughs> and that's something that you want to have happen. Right, exactly. <laughs> right. It's not like, oh, son of a... Yeah. Where's he going? Where is where, he yeah. going? We're, we're four, well, that, four changes ahead happened. of where we're supposed to be. The last time I played at <laughs> your place, John, the drummer did that, and it was... He was doing it out on a song where, when it kicks in... Um, I had to play a lead part that was a little challenging for me, and the faster it was, the more impossible it was for me to play. So I think after the third time in rehearsal, you know, I told him, you know, I stopped in the middle of the thing, and I'm like, yo, you gotta stop speeding up, you're killing me here. He's like, oh, I didn't even realize, you know, that I was doing it. And it was just like, you know, that's when I really noticed that I missed the click there, not necessarily for me, but definitely for the guy uh, holding the beat department. So, Slight lull in there. <laughs> Slight lull. We're pausing um, to hear what, what the karaoke guys off the block are doing. Yeah. It's some good music is what it is. Yeah. I'm trying to think if, if I was forgetting anything about compression. Yeah, we can rock back to that. There's, uh, there's, there is a compression unit that I want to get into. All right, nobody. Anthony's throwing wood on the flare, so when he gets back, nobody can hear him. When he gets back, he's got a contribution to make. <laughs> um. <laughs> I can. That's an edit. Yep. Oh boy. Flag the tape. Uh. 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 Mm. Uh, er, uh, um, uh, <laughs> there's, uh, wait till you, nobody can hear you. Get back over. <laughs> uh, you're on the other side of the heat vortex over there. <laughs> there's, um, there's a, a, a real big plug in guy. His name is Steve Slate. And, uh, from all that I've read and all that I've, like, I, I haven't used any of his products specifically, but Steven Slate drums, from what I understand, are, the the kind of industry standard drum replacement plug-in. Um, he's got all those big old Zeppelin kits, all the old Headley Grange samples and all that stuff. But uh, he actually has a hardware version of some of that stuff. It's uh, slateproaudio.com or something like that. Um, and a lot of guys that use... I, I particularly like the Empirical Labs distressers a lot and I, mm -hmm. I mean you know everybody's got Car those on there Carl's mm, mm -hmm. his, his need to change his pants sound mm -hmm. over there but distressers are are it um, you know Soundgarden like Dave Ratt uses them on uh, Chris Cornell's vocals type of they're they sound awesome on they're, guitars they're just, they, they just they sound good on everything really mm -hmm. Uh, but but usually use them on guitars, vocals, maybe a little bit of kick here and there, depending on what you got. But he's got a uh, an actual hardware compressor as opposed to just the plugins. It's called the Steven the Steve Slate Dragon. Um, it's based off of a, a Neve or I think it's a Neve eleven seventy six um, compressor, but it's got more stuff that you can screw with than eleven seventy six. Um, He's got a plug-in version of it, so I've, I haven't actually used the hardware version of it, but the, the plug-in version of it is unbelievable. It's just, um, if, if you haven't seen or heard or checked out any of the stuff, um, go to, I think it's Steve Slate Digital or SlateDigital.com. Dot Klom. Dot Klom. Lots of Kloms. Um, it's the Polish domain. Uh, the, yeah. It's half a bottle of whiskey and a 12-pack <laughs> of beers. I'm talking. Um... Don't pay attention if you're listening, if you go to the tab. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, edit. Oh. Edit. Mm. Like um, but his stuff just, like, the guys that, that produce and engineer and record the Tool records, the Queens of the Stone Age, the Weezer, um, the Katy Perry records, they swear by this stuff. Like, I, I watched a video earlier today, actually, of one of the guys that does, I mean, if you've heard a pop record... This guy's mixed it. Not Chris Lord Algae. Um, one of the other guys. But 
he's just got a, like a, a 20 space rack full of these Stephen Slate Pro Audio Dragons. And he just runs them on everything. You know, if you can run them on a full kit, that's great. If you don't have an extra $25,000 like me, um, buy the plug-in, I guess. <laughs> but they, they sound fantastic. And I guess veering off of that, like, that's, a, that's an awesome hardware uh, piece that you could have. But <clears throat> um, I just bought a Focusrite uh, 18i6 or 8i16, something like that, where you can plug... Uh, a, uh, a light pipe preamp into and run it all through that. It's got a series, uh, a couple of Focusrite preamps built into it, but it comes with a series of Focusrite plugins. Um, and I was, we, we've recorded some of my wife's stuff, and just the the life that it breathed into. Like I, I did the cheap download version of it until my my preamp comes in. Um, it just, there's a life in the kick drum that I didn't have before. Just plug straight into the box. Uh, and it's an inch from your nose. Right, exactly. Like, it, you can demo it pretty, like, it's free to demo and then, you know, a few bucks to edit. But um, for, like, 250 bucks, you buy a, a preamp or an interface from them, you get the whole package of the, the compressors, the EQs, the gates, and something else. Um, but it... <laughs> Stupid bar band. Uh, <laughs> I'm positive that's karaoke. It's going. karaoke. It's got to be karaoke. John Denver, if you can't hear it in the background. <laughs> but like, I I messed around with it a little bit, and uh, the guy had a gorgeous kit. It was a Yamaha uh, Maple Custom kit. Maybe we should talk about expansion next. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but just threw it on the uh, the kick out and uh, the bass group and uh, the overheads and just. There's, I mean, if you're looking for a low budget solution to breathing some life into your recording, minus you know spending thousands of dollars on some waves plugins, some some serious money, like if you've got to buy the interface to get the plugins, I would absolutely do it. It just it it made the mix come alive, like it it added an analog feel to a digitally produced product that I I haven't heard. Um, just straight out of the box, or well, in the box rather. Nice. Slight lull there. I'm just so enjoying good. the John Denver. So I'm so Denver. The clearer the air gets, the <laughs> louder it gets, and the drunker they get. I mean, it, it's worse than Polly Shore seeing. Uh, Anything. Thank God I'm a country boy in the movie <laughs> Son in Law. I mean, well, that's that's probably yeah. a pretty good reference if you're if you want to, if you can't quite hear that yeah, in the background. I'm like not going to be able to compress this one at all. <laughs> uh, so speaking of compression, um, I've been thinking about the last few minutes while we were sitting here talking about doing a Smash Channel and wondered what you guys if you guys use that for anything. In what aspect do you mean a Smash Channel? All right, well, actually, I guess we should go back and, because uh, we do have some neophyte users who may not be familiar. We, we realized this after we did a whole show on compressors that yeah. we didn't talk about compression at all. So, Anthony and I took it upon ourselves to compression the masses. Compression setting a decibel level at a signal level at which hey, it will whoa. start to compress, and the ratio is for whoa. every decibel over the point of compression, one this dB will come out. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't get way above the Yamaha sound engineering <laughs> manual here. This this is a semi-pro audio blog. <laughs> the thing um, is, we all know so much more than that. That it's <laughs> Well, we don't, we don't know what people are listening. Like, I, if, if you really want, message the blog, I'll, um, I'll take full legal repercussions of PDFing you <laughs> the Yamaha console. You... you Oh, the Yamaha Sound Reinforcement Sound Guidebook. Sound Reinforcement Manual Version 2 is what I've got right now sitting in. The 87? I think, well, printing. it might be in the fire. I don't know. <laughs> well, it's the, around. The compressor, it's a lot like a kitchen it's, appliance where you just say what it does and you add her. <laughs> the refrigerator, the toaster. And like everything else in the audio world, it does the opposite of what it says. Well, it does well, compress, that's, that's a Yamaha product. But the that's effect, all. the oral effect is... Oh, that's oral with an, an aural, oh. aural, 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 um, <laughs> yeah. But anyway, 
uh, the Smash Channel is shorthand for parallel compression, which is a technique where you take an input and split it by, you know, if you're in a DAW or if you have a patch bay or if you just come through a Y cable in your mixer. So you've got one channel coming in mm -hmm. completely unprocessed, and you, you put your EQ on it and your, you know, spatial effects and whatever you're going to do. Then you take the other one, uh, insert a compressor on it, and just smash it. Mm -hmm. set, set phasers to stun and just crush that, that puppy. <laughs> Squeeze the life out of it. William Shatner is standing all over on top of whatever channel you're you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, William Shatner. And, which, <laughs> how about Chuck Norris? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, you give you give the second signal to Chuck Norris and tell him to fit it into an envelope, and he he folds it up and could you go. Thing. Could you go Texas Ranger on that real quick for me? Like a half a millisecond. Thanks. Okay. But the point is, you compress it. You don't do nice compression on it. You do obscene compression on it. You do, you do compression that may not be legal in all 50 states. <laughs> Things then, that your, your, your parents don't let you in the house after a type of compression. <laughs> compression that would make you hang your head. But not to segue too much into silly sound guy jokes. Well, now now you've got two distinct versions of your signal and you can mix them back and forth. This is very similar to the, the double guitar mic strategy that I use a lot. You've got your fat channel and your skinny channel. One channel has a lot of transients in it. It's very dynamic, very interesting to listen to. But at times when you just want things to be fatter without losing those peaks and that interest and that, that sparkle that can be there in a really nice, clean, dynamic vocal, you start pushing up your smash channel. And uh, it's done commonly on vocals. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it works great on a lead vocal. It works great, like, if you bust all your backup vocals to a, a subgroup or a stereo subgroup and, uh, and smash them, then you can work them back and forth, you know, if you want a, a real clear high thing or you know a big fat sound you can work work the two back and forth against each other they work great on drums too i used to do this i mean years ago before i even had a lot of gear i'd i'd uh, just hit the bus all my drums straight to left right and then bus them all to groups one and two compress them up and uh i didn't play them back and forth too much back in those days but you know i just i'd find a spot where like all right drums sound good at that level and then pull up the groups until they fattened up nicely and do any, that. any separation between just run kick snare to a group and then the rest of the drums to another group uh it would depend if i was mixing stereo the whole kit would go because i only had a four boss desk in those days so like the whole kit would go to groups one and two or if i was not mixing in stereo which became the case later on i would do kick and snare on group one and the rest of the kit and the overheads okay. well sometimes the overheads on two and uh that was it i when i was at recording school um we did something very similar to this, and the instructor that um, taught this to us uh, did a bunch of like Megadeth Slayer Metallica in the mid to late eighties. So real, real music. Yeah he he knew a thing or <laughs> he knew a thing or two about you know really big sounding drums. And the only people who know more about those than than that type of person would be like people that worked on ska. Right. So like anybody that has worked with the boss tones in their ilk. Well, like, Carl, Carl oh. falls into that category. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Mm. Um, what we would do is we would do it through an auxiliary send. So it would be, you know, kick, you know, I can't remember if it was both in and out, snare top but not bottom, and then the toms, you know, none of the overheads or anything like that. And, uh, send it out of an aux bus, you know, into some sort of compressor that was set at infinity to one with, like, you know, a negative 25 threshold, and, <laughs> you know, maybe a little bit of makeup game, but we didn't really need it. Oh, you, you breathe it on it. And yeah. It, and you hear yes. a jet engine landing. Yeah. I mean, just... <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Huge. And then, you know, brought that back in on a channel and, uh, mixed it in and, uh... You know, I think, you know, it was cool to do it on an, um, an auxiliary stem because if one piece of the kit was really dominating it in that effect, you, you could just turn that down, mm -hmm. you know, going out of that auxiliary stem. And that stops, like, the kick drum from pumping everything. Right, right. right. Unless so, you want it to if you're doing dance music. Yeah. Mm, yeah, I never, sweet, I had to, sweet dub stuff. I had thought of doing that, but on a six augs mix, I had, you know, four wedges, two effects, and that was it. So I, never, right. I, I had thought of doing that, but it just, it's not possible in a lot yeah. of situations. But that's, that is a good tip. Yeah. Stu studio wise, you know, and I, had, I had tried it, uh, a few times in the, in the projects that I had done, um, you know, 
when I first came back from school with, you know, honestly, varying degrees of success. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I think a lot of times it didn't fit the music that I was mixing. So it, it help it helps though, like for studio wise and stuff. If you if you mix all that stuff, like kick out a snare top, not the bottom, the toms, and maybe even touch overhead, sending them to a, you know, not not taking them out of the total mix, but sending it to another bus and in really brick walling it, um, adding a touch of reverb to it and mixing that back in, you get a different depth of it. If you, if you mix right. it stereo, especially, um, you, had, you had another width of the drums that weren't there before that you could have gotten before, but, but still at the same time, you know, something that, that enhances, especially the type of song you're working on too like if you're working on an R&B song you want the kick you want the snare you don't want so much of the toms and stuff if you're working on a rock song that's that's tom based and stuff it, it helps to mix that kind of stuff right in on top of mm-hmm. what you're working with yeah and really that whole thing it was an effect right you know, it, it wasn't anything that based your sound off of and maybe maybe sometimes not even use for the entire track you know mm-hmm. like alright the drums really need to go not necessarily Nuclear. up a notch, but they need to be in a different dimension for the bridge. Right? right. And so that's when you pop in that return channel coming back into the desk. Right. It, if, if, you don't, if you don't have to use that return channel all the time, mm-hmm. it's not a sin. You're not going to hell for not using that return channel. It's, it's, it's a return channel. It's, it's an effect. It's yeah. not yeah. something that you base your whole mix off of. It's something that... For those, like Carl said, like the exact time that you need it to come through, that's when it comes through. You don't you don't ride it at, at zero the entire mix. You bring it in when it needs to come in. There's a nice drum breakdown with a lot of toms and, and some splash and a little bit of a cymbal. That's fine, but you don't want to be rocking that thing the whole time and then take away from... I guess the drum solo. And you might even compensate for it, too. I mean, well, in recording, you know, you're going to eventually get into the the limiters when you get into the mastering process. But, you know, like doing that mixing live, um, I would probably also have my finger on the drum group and do sort of the opposite of makeup gain. Like, if I'm going to make the drums fatter and have a louder, you know, uh, more apparent volume, then I might bring the actual volume down a little bit. And And that's that's a trick I like to do. I've got a, a bunch of little things that I do mixing live that make something cut through a mix without making it any louder. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I've never tried it live, though. Well, I've never really had um, either the buses to do it or the compressors to do it, so... um, And you 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 haven't had a full rack of 737 SPs? Yeah, Just just sitting around, just for the heck of it. And so, maybe, you know, maybe that's why I haven't tried it, but, you know, really, I I don't know. And this is funny, because it's another example of, you know, there are rules in sound that you should always, always, always follow until you don't. And this just reminds me of, like, in college, I would run into guys that had, like, previously done installs in some of the rooms around campus, and they had two channels of Alesis compression. And so, uh, no, good. One was, uh, you know, they'd have one inserted on the kick channel, and then the other one would just be on AUG 6, you know, in case you wanted to compress something a little. Yeah. <laughs> so, not... Not the thing that you necessarily want to do when all you have is two channels of compression, but if you have one or two left over, the, and, and an augs or two left over, or a, a spot you can insert it on a bus and you know enable and bypass it as needed, yep. then yep. awesome way to, to put your gear into use. And uh, I think Anthony... Hey, would you grab my pop out of the freezer? Awesome. Um, Shoot, I just shot that idea right out of my head. It's been wicked hot here, folks. And if you're listening from warmer climes, uh, 85, 90 degree days are not what we're used to here in Buffalo. We're we're prepped. We are born and bred for the sub-zero temperatures and the biting wind off of the Great Lakes. Uh, not so much for the hot house weather. So we're all yeah. a little cooked. Our blood's a little too thick for this. But... Uh, I remember now. We're. Uh, I, I feel like I just took a look at the time scale. We're probably not going to have enough time to bitch about advanced nightmares. I, I feel like that could probably be a whole whole show. Like we <laughs> should we should just get in a mood. We'll get everybody that we can, and we'll just do advanced nightmare stories for a whole show sometime. It's, uh, the do you have something? <laughs> Okay, I, you look like you're. <laughs> no, it'll take a half hour. I mean. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's the thing is you can't just. 
and, and it'll ruin the mood for anything else too. We we held off on a topic one other time because we we came off a really good story and, and some really good technical knowledge, and, and we were just going to start bitching about something else, so we decided not to do it. Yeah. Um, anyway, when Anthony gets back from the kitchen, we can fill him in on on what we started on. I wanted to, um, and I forgot what it was again. Man, I'm cooked. Um, it had to do with techniques and oh, okay, I got it. And when you um, when you're working on something, the idea of having go to techniques like oh, well, I always I always use this on my snare, and I always use that on my snare. He's I'm, not coming. I'm a creature of habit for sure yeah. but uh anyway to, to elaborate slightly uh, uh all right let me start fresh this will be the second edit <laughs> <laughs> yep rough edit the uh all right when i finally remembered the the idea that it popped into my head it was the idea of having go-to procedures and concepts and things um and are those confining like uh I always put a 57 on my snare, or I always compress this this way. And uh, I personally, I mean, everybody's got all those tricks they like to use, but I'm not so married to any of those that I want at a moment's notice. Usually it's under some duress, like, oh, we don't have that here, or, you know, this is used up, or whatever. Um, so having to go with something else. And uh, it takes a little bit of courage, I think, to, you know, strike out and try something new, but that's where the magic happens. You know, if you talk to any of the great engineers and listen to them talk about some of the greatest records that were ever made, like, how did you get that amazing sound? Like, oh, well, you know, we wanted to do this, we wanted to do that, but we didn't have the right stuff, so we just faked it with, you know, whatever was on hand. Anthony's back with cold drinks. We're talking about uh, having go-to solutions for things, and do you absolutely go to them all the time? Or I Personally, I like to kind of, unless I'm really working in a hurry, I'd I like to start fresh with stuff and maybe do the stuff that I always do, but maybe just do something completely different, even if it's just for the sake of doing something different. I mean, well, I guess you flatline, to, like, to what you got, you know? Like, you got a stack of DBX 1046s that you usually use on Tom Groups or um, snare bottoms and stuff. Like, I guess it all depends on what you got. Not necessarily what you'd like to have. Like, I, I would love to have a bunch of nice Neve channel strips or some API stuff, but when it comes down to it, I don't always have all the stuff to go to that I like to. I think there's a difference between, you know, having go to stuff or having a go to starting point. And, you know, Let's face it, in the live world, we're always under some sort of time constraint right. where we can't reinvent the wheel. So we get to the point where we are where we know we will be um, operational, comfortable, fastest, and then we go from there. Um, I think the biggest thing for me is I get stuck on uh, microphone choices quite a bit, mm -hmm. and I don't let myself uh, try new things sometimes you know I gig a few weeks ago um, they had a bunch of those Audio Technica AE 3000s and you know typically I do a Sennheiser 604 on the rack tom and a 421 on the floor tom great combination works fine but uh, I was like well let's let's try a couple 3000s you know I don't typically like condensers on the toms, but I thought I'd give it a shot, and wouldn't you know it, it actually sounded really good. It was fine, you know? Mm -hmm. um, doesn't mean I went out and bought two of those microphones the next day, <laughs> but um, you know, I'd be more willing to do it next time. Um, you know, and I think it, you know, really my fear of condensers on toms are all because of beta 98s. I just don't like the way they sound. <laughs> so, or them literally getting beaten into right. oblivion. <laughs> so it's just, oh, uh, oh God, you beat it literally into hell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I see those and it's like, well, I don't really like those. So it's like, well, what if somebody has like, you know, the buyer opus, you know, mm -hmm. little condensers. Mm -hmm. Have you used those at all? No. And I no. would probably say no if they really? were, yeah, I like to, well, in a live setting. Well, yeah. that's just because yeah, 
that I'm used to the sound of the dynamic mics. Okay. You know? So well, I've used tiny condensers on toms, and I've gotten so I really like them. And those actually for years let me get away without using overheads in a lot of situations because you yeah, catch sure. all the the symbol reflection off the heads. There's, I mean, there, there's a lot of stuff like in where I work, we've got uh, a 91 in John's beta, <laughs> beta 50 52A on the kick, I, and then an Audix i5, a pair of SM 81s for overhead, and then the Audix D2s on the top toms and the D4 on the on the floor, and it sounds fantastic, but at the same time, like, we used to have um, a set of AKG, I want to say 419 something or others. The little baby pencil mics? Yeah, they, they look... 430s? They, no, no, not 430s, they oh. were 419s, they, they had a gooseneck on them, they, oh, yeah, and they were attached to something that looked like something that I wouldn't even take a second thought of clipping my potato chip bag with, like, they, they like, they... They clipped on the snare. They had this little rubber edge on them. They sounded acceptable, I guess, but with the drums literally in a cage, like a five-wall plexiglass cage with, you know, brown board on the top and stuff, they just they didn't work. Um, there was just too much noise in all of them where you, you just didn't even turn them on for most of the mix, so I switched to the Audix, and they, the Audix sound great on the toms. Like, if that's, if that's the sound that you want out of your toms... Um, you listen to them, you hear them, and you, you decide whether you want them or not. If you don't, then it doesn't work. But for what I'm doing, the Audix series on the Toms work great. They've got that big, stupid 80s tone to them, like the, the big Phil Collins. Like There's a little bit of ring to them, but mostly attack. Um, and the overhead picks up the rest, but like I don't... I don't need the intensity or the, the musical dynamic and the um, I don't know what else to say, but um, like the the, the musicality of the, the ninety eight, like I don't need, I'm not sampling a tom hit, I guess is what it comes down to. I don't want to hear just that one tom. I want to hear the whole kit, and if I just get the attack off of the tom mic and the rest of it off the overheads, that works for me. Mm-hmm. They had a couple of neat experiences. One in particular with tom mics. I used to have these little Audio Technicas. I think they're one thirty fives. Yeah. Little gooseneck. I remember can, them. I love. I love those. They finally all bit the dust, and I'm, oh, really? I'm probably going to re up. But I mean, I've okay. had them for uh, two of them. I got like used. A band gave them to me as a wedding present, and that oh, was. Really? I've been married almost 11 years. <laughs> those, those are the two that I. <laughs> they didn't owe me. <laughs> na- they didn't owe me a thing. Um, but yeah, I had three of them, and I loved them. Uh, uh, yeah. Just as a side note, a an Omni condenser um, actually has a good deal of low end response for being mm-hmm. such a tiny microphone. Mm-hmm. I mean, you think of the. A mic that gets good bass, you think of like large diaphragm condensers or a D112 or something. If I can interject, yeah. um, Radiohead did this. They would have an Omni, I think it was a lav, clipped to the, one of the, the lugs drum. on the kick drum. Oh, yeah, yeah. Really? And that gave a dimension, and that was actually a mic that they requested a lot in their in ears, and their front of house guy gave it a shot as just kind of an ambient mic and uh an internal know, overhead sort of kind of yeah but yeah that's um, an old recording trick is to just pin a lav on the drummer yeah. and you know you it's only one mic so there's no panning to it i mean if, you, right. if it was a stereo lav or something you would you'd have to reverse it sort of to make it look right to the audience mm-hmm. but uh well anyway i had these little mics and they were great like they just they sounded huge uh, they got everything I wanted uh, out of a tom, and even bad sounding toms, I could beat them into shape pretty they're, good. They're, they're more of a horn mic, though, aren't they? they like no, they're they're good. Yeah, they are also good for horns. They're terrific for horns, but yeah, they're they're also well suited to clipping on toms because they're really pretty low profile. You can keep them out yeah. of the drummer's way. They still take hits though, and they just yeah. Yeah, really they get stepped on more than anything else. <laughs> like doing fast changeovers, you try and right. hang them up somewhere, and they just get tromped on. Yep. So mine have all bit the dust. And um, so That's I'm standing here on a stage, and I didn't realize, like, I had been doing two of them in a D112 on a on the, the big floor tom. And uh, so I got to a little festival stage this weekend, and the other two had just bitten the dust. So all I had left in my box at that point was a 57 and a 58. So the high toms got a 57, the first floor got a 58, and the second floor got a D112. And I was like, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to make it sound good. I've got, I, I've got some awesome <laughs> drum sounds. My When my drummer came in and recorded stuff, he had a... He had a five-tom Gretsch kit, um, and I, I still 
regardless of what what anybody else has said, I I like the way Gretsch Toms sound better than than DW Towns. There there's a certain character to them. Like they've got a nice ring and a nice thump to them. Um, and we did the D twos, the Audix D twos on the two rack, a D four on the first floor, a D one twelve on the second floor, which is an eighteen tom, and it sounded like it sounded like. I've heard a lot of guys say they want their their big floor tom to sound like a second kick, and it totally did. Mm -hmm. Like, just a pounding, not necessarily in your face, but you knew it was there. It added a presence to the music that a 14-inch tom couldn't do. Uh A 16-inch tom could almost do, but but the 18-inch tom with a D112 just off to the side just captured all of it. And the concept I wanted to get to is, you know, like, we sort of become snobs. You know, like, I started out using only 57s and 58s on toms because that was literally all I had. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, eventually got better and better stuff, and now I'm, you know, pursuing some Audix stuff and some other stuff. And so, yeah, you know, the thought hadn't occurred to me in more than 10 years to pull out a dynamic vocal mic to stick on my toms. Right. But, uh, and it, like, I don't want to make it sound like I'm... I'm not saying this to pump myself up or sound like I'm all awesome at something, but, you know, I've talked before about, like, what really makes an engineer. It's not the degree on your wall, because there's plenty of cats that have those that... Couldn't mix their way out of a coffee yeah, shop, right? But you know, Buddy Rich could sit down behind, you know, with, with like a bucket and a trash can lid and blow your mind. So, right. I mean, it's it's not the yep. gear you're sitting behind; it's what you do with it. Right. And it was cool because it, you know, I had been mixed on the same Tom mics for a decade <clears throat> when I mixed on my own rig, and I was just super used to them. So, right. in, a, in in a way, it did help. Like what Carl was talking about before is just having your basis and your starting point. And if you've got a sound check a dozen bands in a night at a battle or something and stay on schedule, that's great. You know, bing, bang, boom. You might not even touch them after the third act goes by. But having to, you know, take a band that was going to play for 500 people and, and make it sound like something, like, it kind of put me on my game. Like, oh, gee, you know, here I go. And uh, so it was good. It was a good workout for me to put some more thought into Tom sounds than I usually do. And, right. Uh, you know, the results were great. And the other thing was I uh, did another little outdoor event where um, I only had two channels of compression for the whole thing. It was that situation. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I put one on the kick drum and then uh, put the other one on an ox. Uh-huh. <laughs> but, no, I just I, wanted, I shoved him on the two bus. And I was like, all right, well, we'll just well, – I, I just mixed into it until I had stuff compressed mm-hmm. in the way I wanted it. And the mix just came out great. It was super yeah. solid. It's, it's not to say that that kind of stuff doesn't happen on a regular basis. You know, you've got to – Work, like every every single one of us has worked in a situation where dynamics aren't necessarily the first thing that anybody thinks about. You know, you, you, you get a rider and you cover the mics and all that stuff. But when it comes down to it, if, if you're the end of the budget and your Tom mics don't come up to meeting budget, you got to figure another way around it. Mm-hmm. And it, it's, it adds a different character to your mixing quality and your mixing ability really to... Instead of, you know, I, I would love to have a set of 421s on all my toms, but I don't have an extra $1,000 to spend on 421. So if I got 300 bucks and I can get close to, in a live setting at least, um, for, you know, a 1,000 people on Sunday, if I can do that with some D2s and a D4, that's what I'm going to do. I'd rather save the money and, and spend it later on um, and, and, and make a better example of myself of what I can do as an engineer rather than relying on nice, nice mics. Like, I'm sure every single person here would rather have a 421 on their toms than anything else. Yeah. yeah, to put it succinctly, I mean, you see the same thing in musicians where, you know, cats spend a ton of money on their gear and not a lot of time, not enough time practicing. Right complain, you know, if they, you know, go to sit in and, and play on somebody else's gear, like, oh, well, you know, if this was my kid, I, I could have, or if this is, you know, I'm used to my guitar, like, yeah, mm-hmm. that's great. You know, a really good player could pick up a, you know, a broomstick and a rubber band and blow your mind with it. That Jeremy is one of those people. Right. Like, I've seen Jeremy play on a $3,000 guitar and a $200 guitar, and it sounds like Jeremy. Right. It doesn't matter what he's playing on, doesn't matter what he's playing through, and to some points, that's a little bit of a disadvantage if you want a different type of sound, but Jeremy sounds like Jeremy, and it doesn't matter what he's playing through. Like, he's his fingers are mm-hmm. 100% there. They're 100% in the game, um, no matter what he's playing through, whether it's a, a, a crappy little Marshall 10-inch speaker or a full stack of stuff. He knows how to do 
what he can do to get out of it. And that's like that's that's one of the few things that like I really still look up to Jeremy for that he he can get whatever he wants to get out of a guitar and amp combo out of that guitar and amp combo. Yeah, it's important as an engineer to be able to do that. Right. You know, just, it, it sucks. You know, some nights you're going to have to work harder than others, but um, the band doesn't care, mm -hmm. and the people paying for tickets don't care. Uh, they, they need to hear a good show, and, uh, you know, I think we've talked about it before where you got to figure out what your priority is for those shows and, you know, make that happen. And, you know, when I was touring, there were nights where, well, okay, I don't have a lot of dynamics and I don't have a lot of effects here. So, uh, you know, it's not going to do me any good to complain about how I can't have the delay I want or the reverb for the drums that I want or whatever. Um, the band doesn't care. They just want to make sure that it sounds the best that it can, and you know, right? You make that happen. Um, just because you don't get what you want doesn't mean you just throw the rest of it, <laughs> you know, out. You're, um, you're still working for a paycheck yeah. at the end of the day. Yeah. You know? yeah. And sometimes that means you know, if you're short on compressors, you put them where the money is, and then you might wind up being the compressor. Yeah. Right. You, you <clears throat> ride faders. Riding faders like, on something else to get through the night. That's, I mean, that's where everybody starts from. Yeah. Not everybody's got a whole, you know, 20 space full of dynamics In, off the bat. You know, I, I don't know. I don't rely on compression that much. I see it as kind of a, um, I don't know, what's the word I'm looking for? <clears throat> Crutch. No, not necessarily. I think some people can use it as a crutch, or I see a lot of engineers, you know, turn a compressor on and then not touch that fader for the rest of the show. And that, to me, that seems not right, you know. Um, it, it should make your job easier where you're not making those adjustments maybe as frequently, but, um, you know, I really use compression to kind of take the edge off of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you want there um, to still be dynamics in it. Right. And, uh, you know, I use it a lot on vocals, obviously, you know, whether to keep them in line dynamically or to, you know, maybe uh, get some makeup gain or, you know, whatever. But, um, you know, even with vocals, you know, I might be 8 dB into a lead vocal and my hand is not leaving that fader. It's on it the whole time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, you just yeah. And talking about comfort zones too, I was thinking about <clears throat> excuse me, um, like the way I'll set compression on something, uh, you know, especially if my if I have other stuff on my plate at the time, if I'm dialing in a compressor in mid, you know, mid set, I'll uh, I'll put one finger on the threshold and the other one on the ratio, and just completely use my ears, ignore the markings on the dials, ignore the metering. I'll just push those two back and forth without looking, you know, while I'm watching the band and while I'm fixing monitor mixes and I just keep listening until I've got it. And there have been nights where I get it like, yeah, that's it. All right. I'm good on that. And look over and just find the knobs in strange places and the meters yeah, telling right. odd stories, but whatever. <laughs> and I would have totally missed that if I'd been like, okay, well, I, um, judging from the sound waves I'm hearing, I should uh, set the ratio thusly and the threshold such and so. And right. And that, you, that, I would have totally missed out. That That's a neat factor to, I don't, I don't want to call it, but it really is like the, the Dave, Dave Rat style of mixing where his console is on his right-hand side and all his dynamics are in front of him. Mm -hmm. um, one, of my, one of my buddies got to sit in front of house with him in Toronto mixing a chili pepper show and you know like there's a lot of stuff like that's a type of gig where you've got everything pretty much set like if you're touring with that big of a band for 70, 80, 90 dates you know what they're going to do and depending on what kind of room you're going to know how to adjust it, but the system engineer has a lot more work to do than the, mm -hmm. the guy mixing. Right, but um, like, I'm I'm pretty sure Dave Rat's got a decent hand in in all of that since he yeah. he owns all this stuff. But right. you know, like if if you if you've gotten to a point where your desk is secondary to your dynamics, like if you've got that big of a handle on top of your show, 
is it that big of a difference to, you know, like, I, I'm right-handed, so obviously I want to have my right hand on my mix, but is it a bigger deal to have your dynamics somewhere totally off stage or off, off and back or something like that? Or is it more important to have your front of house in check rather than your dynamics in check for a band that you know exactly what they're going to do? Mm-hmm. Well, Dave's big thing is he doesn't look at anything. I mean, he's got right, his, yeah, as many lights off as possible, and that's a really valid point because I sit behind a Midas too, and where my perch is located up in the balcony and with a, a pretty steep rake on the console, mm-hmm. I have to you know, either stand or sit bolt upright if I'm going to keep my eyes on the stage. Mm-hmm. And that console is a big distraction. You know, there is that tendency you want to just be looking down at stuff and, you know, the metering's all right there or what's more to turn my head and, and look at my outboard gear and see what, what's going on in processing land. Right. And by far, the times that I do the best is when I'm, when I force myself not to pay attention to that stuff and watch what the band's exactly. doing. Because you can right. pick up so much about what's going on. There's sometimes there is a dynamic change in the band that, you're not, you're not accounting for. If it's, you know, if, if you're not on tour with the band for however many dates, um, it's nice to know, like, if you know exactly what they're going to do, you've worked a handful of practices with them, you can set stuff to a certain degree and just need to tweak a little bit, as opposed to, you know, both hands fully out, you know, just waiting for something to go terribly wrong for, <laughs> before you touch something. It's 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 a nicer... That was an interesting dynamic to witness the first time I saw it. Because, like, you know, I go from... When I was mixing bar bands a lot, it was zero the board every night because you never know what you're going to walk into. And then I got to work... Um, I uh, ran monitor mix for a band that got to open for Bon Jovi and hanging out while Bon Jovi's techs were out prepping everything. You know, there's a, a guitar tech talking to the guy out at front of house and all right, how's this? How's that? How's the gain structure? And I hear coming back through the talk back, <laughs> same as it was last night and the night before <laughs> and the night before. So, like, yeah, it's, it's an internal it's delay. It just keeps going. It's an interesting going. Um, thought what you were saying about watching the band or whatever. I feel like I'm the exact opposite of that. Where really? I, and maybe it's because I don't want to be distracted. Oh, that can definitely be distracting, yeah. too. So, you know, if I'm in the zone finger quotes you know my head is down and most of my mental energy is being channeled to my ears if that makes any sense Mm -hmm. and um you know i'm making adjustments based on that and i guess my thought process would be all right my head is down so that i don't really have to process anything visually um you know especially if there's crazy lights going on because you know ooh, yeah. shiny um and my fingers are on the faders making adjustments and then you know a lot of times i'll only look at the stage if something i know is supposed to happen or i think is supposed to happen isn't happening mm-hmm. and then i look out up to find out why you know like why you know i pushed up the saxophone fader for the saxophone solo, but I don't hear it. Well, then I look up to find out that when the horn player was adjusting the mic, he unclipped the 421 from its clip, and now it's behind the security guard in the pit, you know? (laughs) Um, But that's, you know, that's an interesting thought. I, I don't know. I try to concentrate with my ears if that makes any sense oh absolutely i actually you know. my my process is actually both of those i mean i i try to do um <clears throat> i describe it to people i'm teaching is uh the way airline pilot well pilots in general work is you know when you, when you fly a plane so many times a minute you do a sweep of all the dials right and uh what's nice is you know you think about a you know the cockpit of a 747 like how much information there is there it's not it's, as much as you can get on an XL8. <laughs> <laughs> mm, I see your XL8 this, and raise you a VI6. <laughs> this is a this is a semi pro audio blog, Carl. <laughs> keep, but, uh, keep yourself together. I liken it to that. You know, there is there's a lot of information on stage, and depending on on the type of show, like the the services that I mix tend to be pretty coordinated. But you know. People call audibles and stuff happens on stage, so you do need to peek down there periodically and 
you know, so you'd be in tune with what's going on down on the stage. And then also, you know, if you're really in tune with your rig, you should know what every switch and dial and LED should be looking like. And, you know, you got to sweep over that stuff too. So it's a good idea to, to just include the stage in your in your sweep, as it were, as you're looking around the cockpit. Mm-hmm. All right, well, we hit the hour mark there, uh, allowing for some time <laughs> for some cuts and some edits. So I think uh, this is probably a pretty good point to wrap it up because I can hear us all getting more and more tired as the minutes go by and we're talking slower and slower and pausing more and more. So we're going to wrap this one up. And I, I feel like we should, what's a good karaoke number? We could return fire to those jerks. <laughs> like, can, we, uh, can we do a rousing chorus of Stand By Me for the neighbor? <laughs> How about Journey? (laughs) It should be something that's completely out of our range and we can just howl like hound dogs. My wife's here, so anything from the 80s is totally game. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. But anyway, we'll wrap it up with that. We're gonna we're gonna just watch the fire and listen to the drunk neighbors try and sing karaoke. So thanks for tuning in. Hope it was interesting. Hope it was educational. And we would love it if you would send us your feedback. Uh, We're easy to find on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, if you hit the blog, we gave the in, uh, address earlier, and it's probably, if you're watching this on YouTube, highlighted on the screen somewhere. So look us up. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love your uh, thoughts, comments. You can even call up and call us stupid. We don't mind that. Uh, in fact, it's it's part of our job description, really. We're sound guys. <laughs> um, so, yeah, without doing my usual ramble and my, my pleas for attention, I'm just going to wrap it on up. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in, all of you that have and listening. And we will see you next week on the next edition of the Smart to Noise Ratio Pro Audio Podcast. This has been your Friday the 13th edition. That's funny. Oh, except it didn't stop. <laughs>